Thanks again, Kai, for the introduction. So, uh, actually, my, my talk is kind of a nice follow-up with Dorter's talk because it's it's more like the same topic, just uh, applied to a different uh, different group of of uh, living organisms. Um, I will tell you about seabirds in, in the Arctic and seabirds on Svalbard uh, specifically, and how the seabird community is currently changing and and quite fast. So it's it's a work in review as well, just like Dorter's. Uh, Dot his results. It's uh, it's been submitted some weeks ago, so it's not published yet, but hopefully it will be published and available uh, soon. And it's a work that uh, I've done with my colleague from uh, the Norwegian Polar Institute, Halvar Ström. Just for for those of you who are not familiar with, with the Arctic, maybe to to locate where Svalbard is. Um, Svalbard it's it's a Norwegian archipelago in in the high Arctic. It's uh, quite high in latitude. It goes from 74 degrees uh, north. Uh, just trying to get the laser mode. No, it's it froze. Yeah, okay. Uh, so it goes from from this island here, Bear Island or Bjornoya, in, in Norwegian, 74 degrees north, and up to more or less 80, 81 degrees north here. So you have Spitsbergen, the main island, Bjornoya here, and all of this archipelago. It, it's Svalbard. So quite high latitude, but it's not necessarily high Arctic condition all over the place because you have this warm, warmish Atlantic water coming from the south here on the on the west coast. So the part of the west coast, at least in Bjornoya, it's 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 not really high Arctic conditions. But the the eastern part of Svalbard, it's much colder and really uh, it corresponds to to high Arctic uh, high Arctic climate. And, and on Svalbard, you have more than three million. Uh, pairs of 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 birds of seabirds. I mean, this does not count the the geese and ducks uh, um, in, into account, but more than three million pairs of birds of seabirds, meaning that it's it's a really big chunk of the of the Atlantic or East Atlantic, North East Atlantic population of seabirds between Svalbard and and this part of Russia and and Iceland, Northern Norway. You really have uh, a huge amount, a huge proportion of the the entire uh, seabird population in the in the North East Atlantic. And um, we can say there are more or less 17 common species, seabird species. Of course, it really depends on how you define seabird and what you consider to be common, but more or less 17 can be 18, can be 16. It usually really depends on your definition, but here I considered 17 that you can see here. Uh, I will not list everything. It's, it's no need. But what matters in, in here, at least for this talk, is that you can really split this species into two groups of, of birds. You have the real Arctic species that only breed at very high latitude, like uh, Brunix guillemot or thick bill myrrh, the ivory girl, the glaucous girl, the little oak. All these species, you can only find them really in the, in the Arctic, if not the high Arctic. You may have some scattered population or colonies here and there, but the, the vast majority of the population is really, is really associated to, to uh, Arctic conditions. While you have this group of species, like the common guillemot, the northern gannet, the great skua, the puffin, uh, that are more like boreal temperate species. They do breed in the Arctic. Uh, you can have large population, large colonies in the Arctic, but uh, a, a big chunk of their population is also located at southern locations. Just an example here to, to exemplify a bit what I said. These two sister species, very similar species, the Brunix guillemot or thick-billed myrrh in North America. It's a typical Arctic species you see here in purple and orange. This is where they breed. Uh, in, in the summertime, and you see it's only very high in, in latitude. Some small colonies in Newfoundland and Labrador, but really tiny ones, so it does not really count, uh, to, to put it that way. Most of the population is here. It's a real Arctic species. While the common guillemot, you, you find some large colonies in the Arctic, like on Svalbard, uh, on, on Bear Island, this southern island on Svalbard, but most of the population is much more south, like many birds on, on the British Isles, and southern Iceland and uh, southern Norway, even France and Spain, actually. So really, it's more temperate or boreal species. And, and Svalbard, or if I start with the Arctic, as you may know, the Arctic is really warming really fast. It's, it's the place on Earth where the warming is the fastest. And the Barents Sea uh, area and Svalbard, it's the place within the Arctic where the warming is also among the fastest. So things are changing really, really fast on, on Svalbard. And, and the warming, the temperatures have increased drastically in the last decades. Uh, this newspaper, or, or it's from university actually, they say four degrees in 50 years. That's some averages. It's here you see different um, 
occurs from different locations on Svalbard, and it's even steeper if you look at only the winter temperatures. So to say that it, it, it's warming, I mean, it's not even a question, it's warming and it's changing extremely fast. And, and one very basic prediction we, we can test here is, okay, Arctic species, the real, the species really are associated to, to Arctic and cold conditions should, should have trouble to cope with such a warming and might decrease in abundance while the boreal or temperate species are more um, prone to, to increase or at least to cope better and be stable. This is a very basic prediction that we can, we can draw and test. And basically that would mean that there is an ongoing borealization of the Svalbard seabird community. And this is exactly what I will try to, to show you now that this borealization is, is really uh, ongoing. So on Svalbard, we, we're lucky enough to, uh, to have quite good data on many species and we have long-term monitoring data on uh, nine of them. Uh, Brunix guillemot, ivory gull, glaucus gull, and little oak for the, the arctic ones and common guillemot, kittiwake, fulmar, gannet, and great skuas for the boreal one. So it's quite a, a nice, nice number of studies and for some of these birds, the, the, the monitoring data go back to the, the 80s, actually 1986 for the first year of, of, uh, of data. So several decades of, of monitoring data now. And when I say monitoring data, it's population count or colony counts, basically. Very basic work. Uh, it looks, it sounds very simple and basic. It's a bit tricky to do, actually, but it's, uh, it's fun to do, too. We go every year to the same colony from the same place, and we do count the same areas within these colonies. So it's here, it's an example on Bionaya. It's a uh, Brunix Guillemot, I think, plot. And we count all the birds or all the breeders. The, the, the method is a bit different depending on the species considered, but we have this proxy of plot size, number of breeders in the plot, and then we have several plots in the colony, which gives a proxy of the colony size, and then we have several colonies and several species, and we repeat that year after year. Um, so, you know, a very simple data, it's count, but a lot of information in, in, into that. It's an example here from the Brunix Kiyomot, and you see here each color, it's uh, it's one colony on Svalbard. You see that the first data uh, go back to 1987, and then almost every year for many of these colonies, there has been some some monitoring. And the, the, the figure is really, it's not the best one, actually. It's from this website where the data are available. It's a most of NO. Uh, but even if the scale is quite bad, you see there is clearly a very clear and strong decline in all the monitored colony for that particular species. That's the thing we have, we, we know for long now and we have published already, but the, the Brunix Guillermo, it's clearly declining, declining faster on Svalbard. And we have similar data for most of this, uh, of these species here. That's uh, Svalbard again, Bionoya here, which is really south, but uh, you, you see it here. And as you can see, most of the data, except the red circles here that are for the ivory gull, uh, I'll come back to this, but most of the data, they are from three locations. Kongsjorden here, Isjorden, and, and uh, Björnöja, where in each fjord or each location, several colonies might be monitored depending on the, the species considered. And Ivory Gold here, it's a, it's a different system or different monitoring framework. It's basically the entire population that is monitored annually since a bit more than 10 years now. It's a helicopter survey. It's a big logistics involved. It's, uh, it's Halvard Stroll, my colleague, who is leading it. But it, it's a bit different, but still, it's a really a nice and uh, nice information we can get on that species uh, that is really hard to, to study, actually. But uh, just to keep in mind that most of the data, they're really from three sites, and I will come back to this point uh, later on. And this is the current status. It's uh, population growth rate, the annual average growth rate of, of this uh, monitored population for each species and each, uh, each site. Uh, the red circles, it's, uh, Spitsbergen. The triangle, it's Björnöja, Bear Island. And red, that's the boreal species. And blue, that the Arctic species. And even if there is some variation potentially for a given species among, uh, Spitsbergen and Björnöja, you see that the pattern is quite clear actually and really supports what we could predict when it comes to the consequence of, of Svalbard warming. And the Arctic species, they really, they clearly have uh, negative trends, uh, negative annual population growth rate, it's below zero, while the boreal species, they really, the pattern is clear and the, and the trend is much more positive or at least stable for some species. Just to mention that the gannet, it's on a different scale. 
Uh, it's a very new species on Svalbard. It started to breed in 2011 on Svalbard, and it's been it, it's been increasing exponentially since uh, in the last 10 years. So the growth rate is, is still exponential, and it's uh, it's going really fast now. And if we project, if we use these trends, so very simple uh, simulation, if we use that to project what, what will happen, what could happen in the next years or, or decades, this is what we observe. Again, very simple situation, simulation here. It's just to say, okay, if we keep these trends in the next 15 years, how would it look like in terms of, of number of breeding pairs? And again, it's, it's uh, in a way the same here and here, obviously, but the number of Breeding boreal species will clearly increase uh, on Svalbard, where the number of, of Arctic species will clearly decrease. And whether or not the, the, this line cross in two years or eight years or ten years, it does not really matter. The thing is that things are changing really fast, um, and we're really moving from an Arctic-dominated community to a boreal-dominated community when it comes to seabirds. The potential good news, if, if you want to look at this in a, in a, in a positive way, is that the total number of birds may not change drastically, actually, even if some species are really, uh, crashing down, like the, the Brunix guillemot. At the end, it could be that we still have around 3 million breeding pairs in, in 15, 20 years. So, of course, that can be seen as a good news as well. There will still be seabirds on, on Svalbard, um, apparently, and potentially still as many seabirds as we, we have today. But the community will, 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 will be different. And, and with Halvard, we wanted to go a bit farther because obviously such changes in, in community may also affect or will affect the, the ecosystem. And, and we wanted to get some more insight about how this will affect the, the ecosystem, the marine ecosystem. And we, we have looked at the, the functional biodiversity or functional diversity, sorry, of this seabird community. Uh, which means we have looked at the element of biodiversity that influence the ecosystem functioning with the assumption that a higher diversity is usually beneficial for ecosystem stability and resilience. So this is something we wanted to, to look at in, a, in more details. And when it comes to looking at functional diversity, there are usually three proxies, three indices that uh, you can consider. Um, there are many more actually indices, but apparently the three one richness, evenness, and divergence, they explain more or less all the facets of this functional diversity. They are independent from each other, and they, they are correlated to all other functional diversity indices you can think of. So we, we have looked at these uh, indices more specifically, and I will just spend a couple of minutes or at least a couple of slides to explain what they mean for those of you who are not necessarily familiar with it. Uh, I'm not an expert of this kind of topics, but uh, um, I've started to work on that for that particular study, but um, j just to explain, if we consider uh, only three species, let's say the little oak who feeds on plankton, the Brunix guillemot who feeds on fish and invertebrates, and the glaucous girl who feeds on fish and, and potentially other seabirds, uh, we, we have three different species at three different trophic levels, from low trophic level to high trophic level here, okay, just as, a, as an example. If we consider two community with these three species, here we have more or less the same number of oaks, guillemots, and girls, and here we have much more little oaks than girls and and, uh, and guillemots. Okay, very very simple cases. In these two communities, we have the same number of species, so the functional richness, which is the niche extent of the community, uh, will be the same. Sa same number of species, same community, same functional richness. Okay. But if we look at the functional evenness, which is the degree to which the biomass of this community is is distributed in space, uh, then things are very different here because you see that we have clearly one species dominated the, 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 the space here in terms of biomass. So clearly the evenness will be much lower in this community than in this one where the biomass of these three species is more or less spread within the, the, the niche. And the third one is works yes divergence functional divergence uh, it has to do with the degree of niche differentiation among species of, of a given community and here I've considered well, it's an example with uh, only two species oaks and guillemot that have a rather similar diet or at least much closer diet than oak and girls for example okay so this one they feed on on much more similar uh, organism than these two species 
in that case, that means that the divergence in this community is lower than in this one. So it was just to, to sort of explain what these three indices mean to you. Sebastian, are you still with us? Mm -hmm. Niche of this community. Um, I will be very brief here, but basically we have considered. Okay, do you still see and hear me? It seems that my connection has been lost. Yeah, you, you are with us again. Yeah, it's going. Oh. It's going okay. Oh. Okay, I don't know how much you lost. I hope not too much. No, just a couple of seconds. Okay. Uh, so I was saying that this is the, the functional traits we have been considering to, to assess, to quantify the functional diversity of the Svalbard seabird community. We have considered this variable, the nitrogen isotopic ratio, which is a proxy of what they, they feed on. Uh, if you have a high uh, DN ratio, basically you feed at high trophic level. If you have a low value here, you feed at low trophic levels. It's a rough proxy. We have considered the carbon uh, ratio, isotopic ratio, that can tell you about the environment, coastal or pelagic, for example, um, where you feed, and whether or not you dive or you feed at the surface. So it's these two, basically, it's if you feed close or far from the coast and, and at the surface or deep. Again, it's very rough proxy, of course, but uh, and here it's about how much you eat. It's the body mass of the species. So it's more or less a very rough uh, representation of what they eat, where they eat, and how much they eat. And we have integrated that into functional diversity indices. And only the evenness and divergence, actually, because the functional richness, in our case, it's not informative. Uh, the species community is considered to be stable. There is no new species coming in and new no species disappearing completely in the next 15 years. So we have only considered this uh, evenness and divergence. And we have used this simulation data to project the functional diversity in the coming years. And this is what what we obtained. And I will not explain the different colors here. Uh, I can get back to this later. But what matters is really the, the, the trend here, a declining trend. So the divergence in the seabird community will be declining, most likely, meaning that the competition will increase in the seabird community. But the evenness, uh, so how yet they use how they're distributed in the niche space uh, will increase, which could be seen as a positive sign as well. So actually, it's hard to conclude. It's a bit frustrating, or we can see it again in a positive way, but it's hard to conclude about the real consequences for the ecosystem functioning. Competition might increase, but uh, they may use more space in the, in, the, in the marine ecosystem, a functional niche in a way, which could be good for the stability of the ecosystem. So uh, things will change, but how it's still a bit unsure. So to conclude with, with this, there are two key assumptions behind this work I would like to, to stress. They're really important. The first one is that the colony we have been monitoring and, and on which the study is based, they're really from three places. And we assume they're representative of Svalbard, but it might not be the case, of course, as I mentioned earlier, the condition in the east are much colder than in the west. So it might be that it's very different in the east currently, but it's warming too there. Uh, it's warming all over the place on Svalbard, so our conclusion might actually still be uh, robust for, for East Svalbard as well. And the other assumption is that what we are seeing now will be the same in 5, 10, 20 years uh, again. Um, we, we can really argue that this will likely not be the case, but it's a very short time scale, so it's also likely that things will not change drastically in 5, 10 years, and the trend we are seeing now might likely be the same uh, for some of the species at least. But important to keep these two assumptions in mind, of course. But if true, the Svalbard community is really shifting now and uh, it will be mostly made of boreal species very soon. And this confirmed the, the ongoing borealization or atlantification of, of the Arctic, of this part of the Arctic, at least it's several other studies focusing on different um, taxonomic groups that also uh, go in that direction. The Arctic is getting more and more boreal. So as I said, the ecosystem functioning will be affected, but it's it's quite difficult to really say how and what this means for uh, the general ecosystem resilience and, and, and the stability and functioning. And this is part of it, at least, we'll try to, to investigate more during the FACIT project that Kai presented. 
uh, will try to go a bit farther for some aspect of these changes, at least uh, in the coming in the coming years. So hopefully we'll get some more more answers uh, soon. So thank you, everyone, for your uh, attention. I hope uh, you're still here. <laughs>